Welcome. I'm Naz Barma. I'm an associate professor here at the Corbell School of International Studies, and I'm the director of the Scrivener Institute of Public Policy. It's a great pleasure to have you all with us this morning. Um, as we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Denver campus sits on the ancestral homeland of the Cheyenne and Arapaho people who have stewarded this land for generations and whose loss we recognize and mourn. We offer continued respect and support to them and to all the indigenous tribes and nations who call Colorado and the Rocky Mountain West home. We commit to listening and affirming uh, all the stories in our community. We're so pleased to have you all with us again for the second year of our uh, Scrivener Policy Roundtable series. It's great to be in year two. It's not just the first year. So for our third roundtable ever today, we're happy to welcome today's presenters, the Denver uh, Museum of Nature and Sciences Institute for Science and Policy, um, as well as representatives from our other roundtable partners. We have someone from the Common Sense Institute here and uh, other, other folks in the room, um, as well as um, MPP students, staff, and faculty. Um, and uh, in particular, a big welcome to our friends from the media uh, journalism and Film Studies Department. Um, students, thanks for, for joining us for this uh, important conversation. Um, we're very glad, in particular, uh, uh, to, to have an interdisciplinary conversation. That is one of the mandates of the Scrivener Institute, uh, to serve as an interdisciplinary hub for conversations on policy, both on, on campus and with uh, the community um, in which we exist. And so I'd like to invite our dean, Fritz Mayer, dean of the Corbell School, to say just a word about uh, the Corbell School's broader um, civil discourse initiative uh, within which the roundtable is embedded. Thanks, Fred. Well, thanks, Nas. Um, good to see everyone. Welcome. Um, my role is uh, largely ceremonial, but it's um, this is just such a great example of what we're really trying to do at this at the school. And so much of what's happening actually is with is through Scribner around uh, civic engagement generally uh, and civil discourse. And it's, the term is, it can be somewhat controversial, but the basic idea I think is, is familiar that we've somehow as a society uh, start, stopped listening to each other and learning to talk in, and engage with each other in constructive ways. And so we're trying to do our part in that regard across multiple different um, um, venues. Um, this being uh, the first and, 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 and really an important part of what we're trying to do. And it's really about, you know, at our heart we're a bunch of nerds and you know, we're, we, you know we, we really believe in facts and evidence, and um, it's great to disagree, and it's great to argue, but from evidence and, and, and in thoughtful ways. We just launched, um, some of you may have seen uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, what we're calling the Denver Dialogues, which is a partnership with uh, four uh, of America's large think tanks, so from right to left, sort of, Hoover, AEI, uh, Aspen, um, and New America, um, and we had a conversation, Nas and I co-moderated, which was totally fun, a conversation with the heads of those foundations. It was kind of a meta-conversation about civil discourse. It was not an example, really, of, of uh, disagreement, but the idea is that we'll be trying to model that uh, civil engagement disagreement on hard issues, uh, difficult issues, um, and also to involve not just be spectators, but involve our students in follow-up conversations to try to uh, also play out and, and, and demonstrate and learn the skills of, of that kind of engagement. Um, a lot of other things sort of in the, in the offing, but this, Naz, congratulations on this program. This is really terrific, and welcome to everyone. I can't stay too long, so my apologies for ducking out, but um, um, I look forward to at least the initial part of the, of the program. Thanks again for being here. Um, the Scrivener Policy Roundtable that you, we're here for today embodies the same civil discourse objectives that, that Fritz was just discussing by foregrounding local policy issues. Um, uh, and, and one of our real goals is to build a network of, um, uh, as Fritz said, policy nerds like, uh, like I proudly identify myself as, people who are kind of interested in having these conversations. So thank you again for, for joining us. I want to give a special thank you to Katie Aker, the Scrivener Institute Program Manager, uh, who's instrumental in planning all. <laughs> these events and the roundtable concept. And a special thank you to the whole Corbell team today for helping us uh, um, get the room in shape. I think some of you know it wasn't quite <laughs> as we usually like it this morning. So thank you to everyone. I'd like to introduce Frank Laird, our interim senior associate dean and professor at the Corbell School, today's moderator. Frank is a science policy nerd. Can I call you that? Yeah. You thank you. <laughs> I've, I've got oh, you my mic. Yeah. A long-standing <laughs> science policy nerd. Thank you. Um, I'm really looking forward to today's roundtable. Uh, it features, as you can see up here, the Institute for Science and Policy, which is part of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And it's going to focus on how to combat problems of misinformation, something that the ISP and the Museum of Nature and Science are involved in, 
and also our other panelists as well. Today, I just want to introduce our panelists, talk a little bit about the rules of the road as going forward this morning, and then I'll turn it over to people who actually have something interesting to say about it, um, as opposed to me, because I, I, me, I just sort of read the paper occasionally on this. Um, there's nothing new about misinformation. If you are a student of history, you can go find all sorts of outrageous things that have been said in public really over the centuries. But we're living in a moment when information truly is different. It's availability, people's access to it, the speed with which uh, lies can spread. The famous Mark Twain quote, you know, that, uh, uh, quote, that, that a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. Um, so it comes with really special challenges to us today. Um, trust in information, trust in institutions, trust in science, uh, trust in democracy. And thanks to the Institute for Science and Policy, they're going to share some of their work along with the work that's being done by our other panelists who I'll introduce shortly. Um, and we're going to have a short panel, but then we're going to have the breakout sessions amongst the tables because this is intended not simply to be a group of really interesting and lively and smart talking heads, but also uh, to get people in the room talking as well. So I want to say, first and foremost, an enormous thank you to our panelists, and I want to briefly introduce them. And maybe should the panelists come up as I introduce, or at least stand up as I introduce? OK, yeah. So, um, so first, first uh, Kristen Uhlenbach, if you would please. Kristen. Um, Kristen is a communicator, a scientist, and a policy expert. She is the director for the Institute of Science and Policy, and her objective is to ensure that science has a respected role in public discourse and policymaking. Kristen comes to this from working for an amazing array, I mean, looking at her, her resume is really incredible, of nonprofits, think tanks, and government agencies, including doing public outreach for the uh, University Corporation for Atmospheric Research, which is an entity that actually runs the National Center for Atmospheric Research up in Boulder and, and is a collaboration of many universities, the American Geophysical Union, the EPA, the White House Council on Environmental Quality, just to name a few. There, this, I could go on. In addition, she serves on various boards and committees, including that of the American Meteorological Society, United Nations Environment Program, uh, and the Women's Aquatic Network. She has degree, uh, graduate degrees in marine science, um, and an uh, undergraduate degree, I believe, in chemistry, if I remember correctly, and has spent her career really trying to bridge the gap between science policy and society. Laura Frank, Laura, thank you, is the executive director of the Colorado News Collaborative. Laura pioneered collaborative journalism in Colorado, is the founder of iNews, the nonprofit investigative news organization that merged with Rocky Mountain Public Media in 2013, the first such merger in the nation. She and the journalism team, she's part of the journalism team there for seven years, I believe, um, and now leads more than 100 newsrooms, 175, I believe it's right, um, in a collaborative reporting effort through the Colorado News Collaborative. She's a Denver native who has spent 20 years reporting for newspapers, radio, and public television around the country, specializing in investigative reporting and data analysis, and was a founding member of the Inter Institute for Nonprofit News, and now serves as its board chair. She's won awards in both broadcast and print, and her work has led to important changes in the laws that the legislatures pass and in the lives of the people who live here. I can also say that what's so refreshing about meeting Laura is that all I read about media is in the sort of mainstream media, and it's all just doom and gloom, and it's all you know crumbling to dust, and there's nothing anyone can do, and let's just go party. Um, but in fact, there's a whole lot of people creating new models, finding new ways of performing this vital function. And Laura and her organization are really at the vanguard of that. Finally, Martine Carcassonne um, is a professor in communication studies at Colorado State and a very widely published scholar. His interests are focused on rhetoric and public affairs and the theory and practice of deliberative democracy and collaborative governance. He's the founder and still directs the CSU Center for Public Deliberation. The CPD serves as an impartial resource for community dedicated to enhancing local democracy in northern Colorado through collaborative 
um, collaborative decision making and community problem solving. Um, Professor Carcassonne has trained students to serve as impartial facilitators who then work in local governments, school, bo school boards, community uh, organizations, and design, facilitate, and report on public forums on important issues. Again, we hear so much about the cacophony and the violent rhetoric of politics, but what a lot of people don't appreciate is how much work goes on at, at the, gr the ground level to promote genuine civil discourse, the thing we're supposed to be here to celebrate. So Martine, welcome, and thank you for all you do. Um, to, I just want to say a little bit about the format. Um, we'll record the presentations of the event, which we anticipate will take no more than 30 minutes, just the first uh, 30 minutes. We got a, a lot of feedback last year um, that people wanted more discussion. Um, and so we're going to do that this year. So we'll follow the presentation with a session of small group discussions at your tables. You'll see various little things at your tables, notepads and cards and whatnot. Uh, that Kristen will be, uh, will, will guide us through. Um, and we'll have a group uh, exercise, the small group exercise, and then we'll reconvene into a, a brief plenary to report out, and, and Martine will uh, moderate that, that uh, plenary to sort of see what happened in the room. We hope something interesting happened in the room. Um, we will um, be following closed door rules for both the small group and the plenary discussions, um, which means participants are free to use the information that you receive, but comments are not for, for attribution. You don't quote individual people. You don't attribute comments to particular institutions. Um, those of us at the university know we are, we, we're sort of almost like the, you know, the British monarch. We don't officially have any opinions. Uh, we are. We, we don't speak for the university. We only speak for ourselves. But in this case, it's closed door, so please don't attribute anything to any particular institution or to the Corbell School or the University of Denver or the Denver Museum of Nature and Science or any others. Um, these simple guidelines are intended to help facilitate a, a, a both a robust and respectful discussion, a dialogue, and, and that people can feel comfortable that it's not going to sort of come back um, uh, to them in a way they hadn't anticipated. So I'd like now to hand it over to Kristen. And, uh, and let me just add that we are very grateful to ISP for being a partner with us uh, on this roundtable. There we go. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good. Thank you, Frank, very much for those introductions. Um, a huge thank you, of course, to Fritz. Um, since he's almost been here in day one, I've had the pleasure of getting to know him over these past few years, and you're doing amazing work here. Um, and a special thanks, of course, to Nas and the Scrivener Institute for having us be a part of these roundtable conversations. I thoroughly enjoyed the ones last year, and I feel very honored and privileged to be here this year uh, sharing a little bit about our work, which is a little bit different in some of the ecosystem of both the kind of policy slash think tanky type institutions here in Colorado. Um, and thank you to Martine and Laura for being partners of mine recently and for being here today. I'm excited to have a conversation with you. I'm just gonna give you a few minutes about who the Institute is. Um, I don't think very many people quite know that we exist yet. Uh, so um, I am Kristen Uhlenbrock. I'm the director of the Institute for Science and Policy. My colleagues Nicole, Trisha, and Kate have joined me here today as well. Some of them are at your tables. Uh, so get a chance to meet and talk with them and they can talk geek out more about the Institute and what we do. Uh, but we are a project of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. We were founded in 2018, and it came on the heel heels of the 2016 election and the conversations around what should a nature and science museum be doing right now when there's feelings as though science and our state of affairs is really under attack, right? And, and our president and CEO, George Sparks, found at the Institute for Science and Policy, because he's like, you can't have a war on science, science is gonna win out. Um, we know that's not true. We know science is very becoming more and more politicized. Um, but we see the fact that museums have a really special place in society here uh, as cultural institutions, as places that are trusted, 
um, and people have long histories. Um, and so how could we engage in these really hard problems, these wicked problems, for those of you who know that term, um, where there really aren't no easy answers and solutions? How can we as this institution engage in these conversations in a way that is very civil, that's very productive, that brings people together? And so we do that through the lens of how can we incorporate and ensure that science is a part of our conversations and ultimately our decision-making processes and policies. Uh, and so that's how we start, started the Institute. That's been foundational to the work that we do. We see ourselves as this catalyst in this space. Um, and we have most of our work is done through partnerships um, with local institutions here because we can help leverage and amplify some of that impact we have. Um, it's been fascinating because we actually have gotten quite largely engaged in more of that broader public engagement impact the Institute has. And I would say that wasn't part of our initial identity, but it's something we've stepped into. And we find that there's a really strong space for that and um, being associated with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science helps make that happen. So this is our mission and vision. Uh, our work, you know, we like to bring people together. It seems many of us in this room like to do that sort of work. Uh, it starts by bringing people together to have these productive conversations. We also like to get to the root of what we really think the problems are. Um, sometimes in these conversations, we realize that language we are just speaking past each other, right? Language matters. And you could be thinking you're talking about decarbonization of Colorado, and yet the people in the room are talking about two vastly different things and approaches. And so sometimes we have to take a step back just to think about what is the root cause of whatever issue that's really hanging us up as society and start spending our time in that space. Um, and then, of course, we engage. Not only do we engage at the individual level, uh, we try to have a bigger collective impact with our engagement. Um, and we found a really big opportunity for that kind of general science curious audience uh, to engage in these hard conversations that we have. We spend a lot of our time on certain issue areas at the Institute, of course, being associated with the Nature and Science Museum and, and particularly the strengths in my background. We spend a lot in the climate change and energy conversations here in the state. Uh, but you couldn't do science policy work during a pandemic and not engage in COVID-19, um, particularly a lot around the misinformation around COVID-19, which we'll talk a little bit about misinformation today. And that was a little bit of our driving force into that kind of issue area is, as Frank alluded to, misinformation has abounded in society for as long as we know it, right? But there's a fascinating confluence of things in our current day and age here in 2022 that make it a really hard problem. Um, and so we started to engage a little bit in that work around um, COVID-19. So there's a lot of the just follow the science, right? You've heard people say that. <laughs> if only it was that easy. But actually, it shouldn't even be that easy, right? Science does not have all of the answers, right? In our society, science is a really important piece of our fabric. It really helps us understand you know, when we're right, when we're wrong. There are things such as facts. There is evidence. But also, science is a process, right? It is meant to evolve. It is meant to continually be tested and understood. What happens is when some of that science gets politicized in our public fr framework, right? And often, that's because this road to science is pretty complicated. It's pretty curvy. We can get caught in these cul-de-sacs of our biases, our self-interest, you know, our value systems. And so at the Institute, we lean a lot into that human nature aspect of how do we make decisions. Um, and we're not just here shoving science down people's throat, right? It's often very little about the science. That is often what brings us together, we find, is that people want to work on some of these hard problems. And it's just other parts of who we are as society, whether that's the politics of how a decision needs to get made, um, down to just kind of rooted different belief systems and cultures and how do we work kind of through that. And ultimately, our hope is that we have this kind of greater outcome of we're moving towards progress as a society. Um, but it's quite complicated, and so this is just our graphic to show how we think, in a simplified sense, it's not just easy to follow that science, and we would never say that term <laughs> in this day and age. Uh, so let me just spend a minute or two, and I'm going to have Laura and Martine join me up here to talk about why we're here today, which is this topic of misinformation. Also, disinformation, malinformation, uh, very common phrases. They all mean something differently, right? Misinformation is just that misuse of facts. Uh, often, sometimes it's unintentional. It's just misuse of it. That um, disinformation, that is intentionality. 
someone is purposely trying to spread uh, deliberate misinformation. Um, and then the malintentioned one that many of you may have heard about too, uh, that is intent to harm. Uh, we haven't spent a lot of time, those, they're all intersected and interrelated in this conversation series that we've put together, but collectively we've just been using the word misinformation in pretty general sense. Um, the Institute came to this, like I said, because you, this was really front and center a lot to what was happening around COVID-19, um, trusting kind of who were you trusting at the time, what information were you getting your information from, whether that was, you know, types of medicine and things that you were taking before we had vaccines, uh, to trying to listen to public health officials. Um, and so that led us to 2021 doing some uh, research and some work. We held our big annual symposium on misinformation. Um, and I started having conversations with others around this topic too, because it really is a threat to our democracy today. It is a major threat to the media and journalism landscape. Um, and so luckily, you know, I've known Laura here for a little bit and I, I reached out to Laura and was like, hey, you know, I got some funding, <laughs> a little bit of funding to do some work uh, specifically through, um, I'll bring this slide up, um, the Association of Science and Technology Centers. Uh, they have a community science initiative that gave us some funding. I feel very lucky uh, through the Jan, Jan Zuckerberg initiative to do some deliberation and dialogue tactics, which we're going to do today. So I started talking with Laura about some of the work that they're doing at CoLab. Um, and we started to have that conversation through how can we make this really local? Because a lot of our work around this information came down to those conversations that you could have with a friend or a family member, or perhaps even a stranger, right? Because like solving it from a really big policy landscape is pretty hard right now. Um, but there are things that you can be doing individually right now. We like to find those tools. And so Laura has some great work that she's going to be sharing that she's been doing with CoLabs. Martine has some great work as well. So we looped in Martine. He's been doing some deliberative journalism work up around the Fort Collins area. And ultimately, we're like, well, how do we kind of bring some of these different efforts together um, and really center it around communities and how they are directly impacted when misinformation has spread in their community? Um, and so this kind of came together earlier this summer. We started around December, January, I think, in our conversations and hosted a couple of events um, where we did some survey work and some research in advance to start gathering data and viewpoints around this topic here in Colorado. And I'll offer, I didn't give that caveat, most of our work is focused here in Colorado, um, pretty obviously. We do keep an eye on and open ear and door to what's happening nationally and internationally, but we really focus on issues that matter here to Coloradans. Um, and so we did some research, uh, brought together viewpoints that turned into ultimately uh, our final product was a discussion guide that individuals can use um, in their own communities and in their own lives. And so we're gonna share a little bit of that work today. Um, but let me have Laura and Martine join me up here. We're gonna have a little bit of a conversation um, about this work and this topic. Thank you very much for being here today. Much easier versus me trying to like feel like I'm leaning into a mic. Um, so to my left is Laura Frank, and then on the other side of her is Martin Carcasson. Laura, will you share just a little bit about CoLab, who you are, how you came to exist, and sure. everything? We, we are new, too. Is my mic picking me up OK? OK, great. Um, we're new, too. The Colorado News Collaborative was born right about the time that the pandemic started, because it's always a good idea to start a new venture when there's a global <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> raging. Um, the idea, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We work with news media and communities throughout Colorado. So in the short amount of time, two and a half years that we have existed, CoLab has grown to more than 175 news organizations across the state working together. Um, and every time I say that, Frank can uh, vouch for this, People say, there are 175 news organizations in Colorado. Yes, there are, and there are actually a few more of that. But most of them do participate in some level in CoLab. And we do three things. We shorthand it by saying we do better news, more trust, faster evolution. And what that means is better news, we have on staff some veteran journalists uh, who collaborate, lead collaborative projects with those news organizations usually not all 175 together at the same time, but groups of them 
and different levels of um, participation, but we do coaching and collaborative projects focused on investigative or um, accountability journalism that any one of those newsrooms would find difficult to do alone. So we leverage the power of that network, which is pretty exciting and something that is really um, gaining a lot of attention here and nationally. So that's better news. The more trust is community engagement, and that's where our work here came in. So one of the things that CoLab has done over the past two and a half years is pull together communities of color from across Colorado through our Voices initiative, because we know media has not always well served all communities. In fact, they've not served some communities, and in fact, we've harmed some communities. So there's a lot of work to be done. So through our Voices initiative, we began to bring together black voices, Latinx voices, Asian American Pacific Islander voices, and native indigenous voices. Those four separate groups, we pulled together working groups and had them think about what could we recommend that would change the way media interacted and served those communities. And so this project actually is something that came, at, for a collab, came out of that work because we invited people in. Um, misinformation was one of the big concerns that all four of those organizations, those groups rather, had. So that, that's the more trust, we're building trust. And then the last thing is the faster evolution. We're helping to um, change the, the business models and the best practices so that, because we know news organizations that are financially strong do stronger journalism. It's just, uh, everyone knows that, right? So we're trying to help them um, get to the point where they can do more better news and more better news and uh, more uh, community building and, and trust building. So that's CoLab. Martine, share a little bit about what CPD does um, and some of this deliberative journalism work and how you came to this topic of misinformation. Yeah, um, so basically for the last, I guess, 20 years or so of my life, I've focused on how we talk about tough issues. Again, I'm a communication studies professor. My actual initial academic training, going back to Fritz's comments and, and connecting with the Institute, uh, was in argumentation, right? Uh, so like, how do people make arguments? How do they back up their arguments? You know, what, we, what is quality evidence? What's a quality source? How do we avoid logical fallacies and all those type of things? Um, but then as I studied national politics, and initially I focused much more on the kind of national uh, level, particularly American presidents, I got more and more frustrated <laughs> uh, because it, was, it seemed like this political game more focused on winning elections rather than actually solving our problems. Uh, so when I got to CSU now 18, 19 years ago, I shifted from national to local, and I shifted from being more of a, I was a rhetorical critic, right? I would write papers about how other people were talking about issues. I was doing well, I was publishing, but basically all my papers were about how badly we were talking about tough issues, and that seemed like a pretty crappy career, right? <laughs> writing, writing articles for 40 years about how bad everything is. Uh, so I shifted from national to local, I shifted from being a critic to being more practitioner, um, and at least started in my classes of what happens when you, you know, use process design to kind of shift the conversation, right? Um, and that's what, what became the CPD as this kind of ongoing experiment uh, of, of, you know, if you play an impartial role, if you, if you help your community uh, have the kind of conversations we need to have. Because uh, the basic argument of my work in the CPD is democracy is hard. Democracy requires some pretty tough conversations, and unfortunately those conversations don't happen naturally. I, I do a lot of work in social psychology and brain science. Uh, we're much more wired for polarization and outrage than we are for collaboration and deliberation. Uh, but we can also use process design to avoid triggering the worst of human nature and actually tap into some pretty good stuff of human nature. Uh, you know, so the CPD is kind of this ongoing attempt to do that. The connection to misinformation um, is this, and, and I think you know, your, your graphics kind of said it, you know, <coughs> Really good information helps us have better conversations, helps us come up with better uh, decisions and better actions to kind of address our shared problems uh, more productively. Uh, when we're awash with misinformation and bad information and disinformation, uh, that makes the really difficult conversations we need to have, engaging our different values and, and all these complexities, it makes it even harder, right? Uh, you know, so how do we rebuild that? How do we have information, you know, science is never gonna make the decisions for us. Right? Because most of our hardest topics are wicked problems that have multiple underlining values. Uh, but good information can make those conversations much better. 
right? So the, the heart of this is how, how do we bring kind of democracy and science together in more productive ways to again get, uh, build capacity in our communities to have the kind of conversations and the kind of collaborative action and co-creation that we need to, to take on our shared problems. Thank you. And Martin, maybe share a little bit about some of that social psychology around this information, because that was really fundamental to us starting this work, was not just to be like, oh, we all think misinformation is a problem, let's sit around and start talking about our viewpoints on it. But Martin did a really nice job um, in our series of, of setting up with a little bit of that social psychology. It, and it's pretty accessible, and it's important because we all kind of, I think, know it, but it helps when someone reminds you of it. So give us a few of those key things that you've seen that has come out as it applies to this topic of misinformation. Yeah, uh, and you know, if people are interested in this, I've got my business cards. I, I'm happy to share some, some stuff I've written. You know, I've got a short little five-page review, a National Civic Review that talks about this, and I've got the 60-page kind of deep dive into the literature. Um, but yeah, when you look into, you know, I dug into the, to the research on social psychology and brain science, uh, from a process design perspective, right? How do I design processes uh, to, to avoid triggering the worst and, and, and actually tap into the best? Uh, and unfortunately, you know, most of what I heard was, was rather scary, right? About how easy, you know, our, our brains want simple. Our brains want certainty. Our brains love a simple good versus evil narrative. Uh, we love heroes and victims and villains. And once we decide who's playing each character, we see the world through that lens. Uh, you know, and unfortunately, you know, once I understood kind of how our brains are wired, then you start looking at our national politics, you know, a two-party system with winner-take-all winner, uh, winner elections, you, you realize how much, uh, you know, why our national conversation is so bad, uh, because, you know, it almost seems designed to bring out the worst in us. Uh, so a lot of my work, and this is part of uh, bringing in Laura in a sense, uh, is shifting how in local communities can we change that conversation. We certainly need to change the national conversation. That's a, a pretty daunting thing. I've got colleagues that are working on it, and uh, God bless them, I hope they do well. Uh, but my work is, okay, how in a local community can we start having these conversations? So then that brings the journalists, right? Uh, you know, quality journalism can be critical to a local information ecosystem um, that helps us. And, and journalists that are equipped with the knowledge of the social psychology and kind of the deliberation uh, skills, which is part of this deliberative journalism project, bringing these two worlds together, uh, is an exciting new initiative we started kind of last fall uh, to really think about, you know, how can we really equip journalists and, and hopefully kind of have this win-win, right? right? That right. journalists provide this <laughs> critical need communities have, um, you know, for this, you know, impartial resources that, that are, you know, focused on helping us elevate our conversations while at the same time, you know, remaking journalism, mm -hmm. right? And, and kind of creating a new narrative uh, and, and people realize, you know, the, the importance of quality journalism uh, so how those two things kind of go together, right? Yeah. In some ways, it was a little bit like applying the Hippocratic Oath to journalism, <laughs> do no harm. So we had to um, help journalists unlearn some of the storytelling things that we maybe were taught in uh, journalism yeah. school mm -hmm. of, okay, find the hero, find the bad guy, make it very, make yeah. sure it's black and white because you got to get your facts uh, complete. And, and it's very difficult to uh, help people feel comfortable in talking about those yeah. gray areas. So one of the first things that we did was bring together journalists to train them in the techniques yeah. uh, that Martine has been perfecting. Share a little bit more about how journalists have been thinking, how you've had to help journalists rethink their role, particularly as it relates to this relationship at the local community level. Well, and, and so even the idea of engagement for journalists is something that um, walks right up to the line of being uncomfortable because journalists are taught to be observers, we don't participate, we document. Um, and so being able to help them see that having conversation with community and understanding, you know, it's so important, the underlying values that people share, even if those values take you in different directions, and this is all gonna make a lot more sense to you all in a short amount of time because we're gonna do it here today. Um, helping journalists feel comfortable in having, participating in those conversations was a, was a big deal for journalists. And my belief was that it would not only help them in the conversations that we were hosting through this program, but it could help them in their daily work to be able to talk about um, all issues political, which now seems like all issues, um, and, and be able to get to, in their communities, what are the underlying values that are driving people toward what tend to now be very polarized positions. And if we could understand that, if journalists could play a role in helping people 
understand why we are where we are and where we are, then we could begin to change the way that a community thinks and speaks and acts about the, the issues um, facing it on the local level. Yeah, no, a, a couple things maybe to add. So uh, one big part of my work, you know, coming out of the social psychology, psychology and brain science is how do we kind of switch from this kind of primarily adversarial perspective that our politics and begin potentially national, you know, red versus blue and so forth, right? Because mm -hmm. when we're in adversarial mode, that's when the most negative aspects of our brain, the simple, the confirmation bias and so forth kind of comes out. Uh, and when we're in adversarial mode, then facts don't matter, right? Uh, you know, facts don't change minds. We know that. There's actually some pretty scary research on how if you're using facts to try to convince someone who thinks differently than you, it's very likely to backfire. Um, and, and in some ways, the, the stronger your argument, the more they'll backfire because their brain has to find a flaw in your argument. Uh, so I try to switch from adversarial mode to collaborative mode because um, that does shift from bring out the worst in human nature to bring out the best. One of the really good things about the research is humans are really good collaborative, creative problem solvers when asked to be, when put in a situation to be that, right? Uh, but if we have a simple narrative, if, if the problem is just caused by bad people, right? We don't need to get creative. We just need to vanquish evil, right? And Disney has taught us that since we were young, right? Um, you know, so that's what we're trying to shift in a way is how can we use that? And an inherent part of that shift, when we switch from adversarial to collaborative uh, or you know, assuming wicked people to putting the wickedness in the problem, uh, we switch uh, to collaborate. And that's where facts matter again, right? Because when we're adversarial, facts don't matter. They're ammunition or they're fake news. Uh, when we want to solve a problem together, we want good information. And all of a sudden, the data, the science that we care about becomes much more useful. Right? The other quick thing I'll say, uh, and I've done additional work on this if people are interested, whenever I introduce the CBD or on the bio, it, you know, it frames it as an impartial resource for the Northern Colorado community. What the heck does it mean to be impartial these days in this hyper-partisan kind of crazy world? You know, journalists, you know, it's supposed to be uh, objective. You know, a museum is supposed to be apolitical. Uh, I'm at a public institution that, uh, you know, and, and I work with librarians kind of similar. There's all these professions that have some sort of commitment to impartiality or neutrality or objectivity or bipartisan or so forth. Very difficult these days when everything's kind of a fight. Uh, but those resources are critical. Our communities need trusted bridging institutions that bring people together. Uh, so we're having to rethink what it means to be impartial these days. Right? So I just wrote another article kind of digging in on that. Uh, but it's just interesting how all our institutions have some sort of commitment to it, some sort of danger of getting involved politically, mm -hmm. right? Because if we get involved politically and people see us as partisans, as soon as they see us as partisan, we're dismissed by half of it, right? Uh, so negotiating those tensions, I think, is a, is a key part of the work that we're doing. I think Scribner is going to probably dealing with the same thing, right? That you want to be a trusted resource. You want to be seen as an honest broker. You want to be seen as a convener. That's being more and more difficult these days, right? Uh, but I think we have to, instead of abandoning neutrality, as some are arguing for, I think we just need to figure out more nuanced ways to kind of carve out that space and, and play that role in our community. And, and the science argues for it because, it, you know, I am familiar with the research that says facts don't matter. That is really disappointing to a lifelong investigative journalist who, you know, that's, that's bad news. So the news that you can move, brain science shows, you can move from facts don't matter to, ah, we can be open and hear and comprehend and process facts in some way, then that has to be the path we take. It, there's no other choice than to figure out how to get all of us to go down this path. So that's why I, this work is so exciting to me. I would offer it's, um, it's a labor of love, right? That doesn't happen overnight. Like it, it's so much focused on process. It's so much focused on relationship building, right? And that sometimes isn't sexy to a lot of people. It doesn't like, you know, people want you to take a position. Uh, if I what, didn't have a day go by that someone didn't want us to do something that we weren't doing, I don't know if I would have a job anymore. Um, so I'm frequently trying to balance that myself, too, of being, you know, quote, unquote, neutral in a political space. Uh, we often say we're, we're policy neutral. I'm not taking a position on a specific policy, right? But there are things inherent, obviously, in our work that you can say, well, that's a position, even though it shouldn't be a position this day and age. But the pro point of the process, I think, in what we've been doing is great. Um, I'm going to transition us here to a conversation, but I would each of you, maybe your one for final thought on like where do you see some of the work you're doing, this relationship going next? Because we jokingly have said we're not done with this, right? Even though we kind of had some funding and started doing it, we, all, we started something and we're excited to see it continue on. 
But through your own lens, like what's what's optimistic for you looking ahead here? Yeah, yeah. I, I hope that we can really begin to change the way that one, journalists think about their role in community and the way that we are asking questions, moving from that kind of um, completely adversarial, you know, journalists can make everyone mad. It doesn't matter what your policy position is, but to really get beneath that, um, you all know it, it's the horse race coverage of politics, it's the um, he said, she said coverage, really getting uh, underneath that to what is driving the fears and the um, politicization and the polarization. Uh, hel helping journalists get to understand that is the level of questioning and research that you're trying to get to, which is um, even harder to do in this era of journalists have half the people around them in their newsroom are gone because they've been laid off over the last 10, 15 years. Um, there are eight more deadlines to meet because of Twitter and TikTok and all of those things. Um, so the pressure to produce is much different now in a newsroom than it was maybe when I was a very young journalist. Um, so we've got a lot to, to overcome, but I hope that having these conversations, seeing the value of, of being able to incorporate that kind of work within journalism will really begin to make a difference for communities and, and their relationship with something that's covered by the First Amendment to the US Constitution. There is a reason that it is covered by that. So we know it's important to a healthy democracy. Yeah, I'll just say you know the, the work that we, again, started last year with the, the Northern Colorado Deliberative Journalism Project, which I think is expanding and, and, and it's exciting. And y'all found us, right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I remember yeah. getting the email for, from y'all afterwards. Um, and, and Colorado is such a hotbed for this, right? I mean, there's so much innovation. Yes, it's a crisis, but crisis sparks innovation. Mm -hmm. Crisis starts creativity, uh, and there's so much kind of great work going on. Um, so, you know, for, for for 18 years or 16 years now with the CBD, I've been running events, right? You know, training the students and running events in the community, and, and we know those events work, right? We know this process works. I know even with highly polarized issues. Uh, you know, give me some time and give me, some, you know, uh, ways to, of framing it. You know, we can spark a much better conversation. Uh, each time we do an event, uh, even though it, it, we're getting people's brains to work differently, right, th they realize the value. Uh, when we give them a chance to have an authentic conversation, they see the value of it and they turn away from the more kind of polarizing thing. Uh, so really this journalism is shifting. Okay, let, let's shift from the forum, from the event, and, and how can we uh, have a broader impact on the ongoing conversation, right? Um, and, you know, and, and tapping into a lot of these newsrooms and the newspapers and you know, public radio and so forth uh, to, to take that conversation uh, much broader and impact a lot more people. Uh, and then finding ways you know, to bring it, you know, the library is part of, of the process, the League of Women Voters, you know, so then there are all these organizations now uh, that are seeing you know, committed to helping us have the conversations we need to have uh, and committed to kind of building the capacity to actually do that well. So. And hopefully we're building capacity today by doing some a little bit of work with you. Okay, uh, thank you, Martine and Laura, uh, absolutely. So we're gonna move a little bit into um, some activities and then we're gonna come back towards the end there and have a little bit of a conversation. And I'll offer if there's some questions, perhaps any of us during that last bit too, uh, we're happy to take them there. But um, the point of today was to give you all that ability to have conversations with each other.